Is anybody excited about Jesus? I said, is anybody excited about Jesus? Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. Man, he's so faithful. He's so good. Uh, today, I, I believe that this sermon is going to rock some folks' world. All right? So just look to your neighbor say, get ready. Look to your other neighbor say, get ready. Come on now. If you're looking at the wall, it's okay. It's okay. Get ready. God is so good. God is so faithful. You know, as I, as I look through different portions of Scripture, I try to, like, maybe, maybe see things from different um, perspectives and uh, just trying to look in deeper ways. It's part of studying, right? We want to study out God's Word. Uh, so we cross-reference. We look at different things through the Word. We want to see where is, where is God going with, with this portion of Scripture, but it makes sense over here also. And it makes sense over here also. So today, uh, I might be going a little bit back and forth between some things. You will not get lost because, as you know, I am, I, I'm, I try to make it as simple as possible because we like to just have fun and understand what God is wanting to say and do. Amen? Some of you, maybe you had a crazy life. I don't know, maybe a crazy week, a crazy month. Or, or maybe you're like me, Vida Loca, like your life has been just crazy, right? Maybe you say, I, I, man, I've, I've, I, my, my children are crazy or my grandchildren are crazy or my parents were crazy. I'm going to tell you right now, ditto, mine too. All of it, to all of it, except I don't have any grandkids yet, but everyone's crazy around me and has been crazy. Uh, but I had this, this, this weird upbringing, right? And I, I shared a little bit of my testimony with you guys probably a billion times, so you're probably tired of hearing it. But we know every week uh, there's new people, probably people watching online that's never heard. So doctor said I would never speak. I died at a young age from suffocation. I've had over 70 surgeries on my throat. That's just part of the part of the testimony. Both of my parents, unfortunately, were addicted to drugs and just were, were on the streets doing a bunch of crazy stuff. Uh, and my, my life was just chaotic a little bit. And I don't know why my parents chose to do certain things, but this story that I'm about to tell you is one of those questions of why did you do it, but then how God can like maybe redeem it in the end. Amen? So crazy life for me. Loco, loca, everything. It was crazy. Um, I remember one time, my parents obviously didn't have a sitter. So they decided to take me with them to their court appearance. Yeah. I was in the courtroom with my mom and dad, and then the judge called, like, you know, people are taking turns, I guess, doing their deal. I was only five years old. My voice had barely developed into, like, a little whisper. So I had a voice like this. And um, I was sitting in, in, on the pew, and... And um, they call my parents' name. And I just, I just remember I was like, oh, okay. Like, I'm going to go with you. And they're like, no, 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 stay right here. My mom's like, stay right here. And a lady comes from um, the front um, be where the judge is at, comes, walks with me, uh, walks towards me, and sits right next to me. And I'm like, mm, who this lady be, right? She goes, oh, don't worry. I I'm going to sit with you, okay? And my mom's like, you're fine, son. So I'm like, all right, this is weird. Well, sentencing begins. You know, I don't know what they were thinking. They thought they were going to go home. Well, the judge says, boom, sentencing to such and such time and such and such time. Sentence both of my parents. Hank, the, the sheriff comes, handcuffs my parents, and I'm looking up. I'm five years old, remember. And all I remember was, no, what's happening? The lady next to me has the nerve to say, Lily, you're going to come home with me, okay? Oh, heck no. So now I'm like, oh, like I'm freaking out. I jump over the pews. I, I jump over the little, uh, little door thing that the court officer has. The officer's trying to grab me. I'm going under his legs. No joke. This is true. And I cling to my mom as she has her handcuffs on. And I cling to my mother. And I'm screaming, Mom, please, please, no, no. Don't let him take you. And as I'm screaming this, the judge calls the sheriff. And they start a little whispering to each other. And they said, let the mother go. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> my mom and dad hate when I share these kind of stories. <laughs> but it's my life. I experienced this. Because they're pastors now. You know, they want to look holy and stuff. <laughs> but I'll be sharing all their business.
You wasn't holy all the time. The devil is a lie. So are you. All right, all right. The verdict was changed due to the situation at hand. I don't know who's been standing in the gap for you. I don't know who's been clinging to you and saying, hey, I'm not going to let you go until something changes. I don't know who you've become for other people. But I believe that God is calling us in this season, in this time, to change around some stories. To change some verdicts. And the Lord says, you've been acquitted. You're not guilty. Whoo! Huh. Now for the word. Y'all ready? Revelations. Did you just say you're going to Revelations, Pastor Will? Yes, I did. <laughs> Revelations chapter 2, verse 17. And hell is real. No, okay, no, that's not it. And <laughs> if you don't get right, you're going to get left. Okay, no. That's what you want me to preach. Revelations chapter 2, verse 17 it says, Whoever has ears, let them hear. Come on, somebody say, I'm listening. Let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, come on. Hey, I will give some of the hidden manna. It's crazy how we've been talking about new bread, manna in this church, in this house. I believe God is uh, baking something up. He got something stirring up. He got something cooking. Amen. I'm, I'm excited for this new bread. The bread represents life, new life. God is doing something fresh in this house and in this city. I believe Bakersfield, man, it got something special on it. People don't believe me, but I, I believe it. So if you've been planning on leaving California, let me tell you something. It ain't going to work out. God, God has some amazing stuff for this state, but I believe for this county, for this city. I believe this is the epicenter of a revival, of a breakthrough that is going to shift our nation. Bakersfield, get ready because God is about to do something special. Come on. You want me to say it again? God is about to do something crazy in this city. Will you be the remnant? Will you be the ones to rise up and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ? Come on, church. It's about to get crazy. I see it. I see worship breaking out in the streets. I see bullhorns coming back and people preaching the gospel at the street corners, letting them know that there's a God that loves them, that died for their sins to save them. Come on, church. Something is shifting. Something is changing. Whoa. All right. To the one who is victorious, I will give him the hidden manna. But here's where we're going to hit at right here. This is about to slap somebody in a good way. I also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it. Known only to the one who receives it. Woo, yeah. It's about to get good. Somebody say it's about to get good. Come on. God is the only one who could give the white stone. And I, I, you're, you're, you're thinking like I'm thinking, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> right? Some of you are like, no, I know exactly what it means. Don't, don't lie. Don't lie. I didn't even know what it means. I had to get on my knees. I was like, Lord, reveal to me what the heck a white stone is. Lord, I'm like, Lord, speak to me now. And nothing was happening. Then I would go to the Word, and I'm like, Lord, speak to me. And then I went to Google, and there it was. Got some references, got a bunch of stuff. Come on now, Google. We find that the, re the, the white stone, not only, some people are going to say purity. Yes, purity. But it is, this white stone means not guilty. Bless you, bless me, bless all of us. That's what it means. Check this out. Check this out. Back in those days, it was a little bit different from the, from, the, from the courtroom that maybe you've been in. 
or the one that I was jumping over pews in. But what would happen is they would have multiple judges in front and they would hand them the white stone. And then they would hand each and every one of them a black stone. Only they knew what they were going to say to the person standing in front of them who was saying, I didn't commit the murder. I didn't do this. They would tell their story. And then what they would do is they would hide their hand, whatever they thought it was. They would put that color into the deal. And whatever came out, the fraction that was the most, you were either guilty or Guilty or not guilty. I got fired up reading the scripture. Because I was like, no, Jesus, you didn't do that to me. You didn't do that to me. That I will give that person a white stone. Not guilty. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I get pumped up about this kind of stuff. That he would give you a white stone that says, not guilty. And he gives you a new name. What does that mean? New beginning. Fresh start. New mindset. <laughs> I'm starting over. Sometimes, I'm not going to lie. I might be carrying this, but I feel like this. Because I know what I've done. I know my mistakes. I know my issues. I know my problems. And what God is saying is, hey, listen, you might feel like this, but the reality is you're holding on to, to this. You're not guilty. You've been acquitted. Come on now, O.J. Simpson. You, you, listen, you did it. You for sure did it. But we're going to let you go. Oh, if the club don't fit, acquit. No, you lie. <laughs> the following crimes caught up to you. All right, listen. I'm sorry. We, we, we ain't going to. No, O.J. Simpson's a good man. Good man, not guilty. All right. Whew. These are the stones that have been placed in front of our lives and we look and we, we want to see who's guilty, who's not guilty. Who's for the Lord, who's not for the Lord. And then we become the sin patrol. And we want to manage other people. And we begin to start rolling the dice. What do I think about him right now? Oh, sister so-and-so is wearing that skirt today. Guilty. Is their hands up during worship? Oh, they must have been sinning. And, and we start throwing these stones of death and condemnation. And we start to put ourselves in the judge's seat. And we start to figure out, let me see if that person's guilty or not guilty. The judges in these times would stand before someone and they would put, in, put a stone forward that would say who is guilty and who is not. I love that the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 17 says something about the Lord. It says, then he adds, there was, there was something he said before this. He says, their sins and lawless acts I will remember. People stop there though. I'll remember. God remembers. He knows it all. You sinner. God says, I'll remember no more. How much more will he remember? How far did he throw it? Scripture says as far as the what? East is to the west. And he remembers them what? No more. So there's two scriptures that back it up. He ain't lying about it. Right? He's honest. He's truth. He's real. He's pure. He's righteous. What he says is for you. It is for me. He says, I will remember your deeds no more. You know what the biggest problem in the church today is that while he's remembering no more, we never forget. 
You said, say it again. You could also go back on YouTube later and see what I said. No. But here's the deal. Well, we can't, well, what did I say? He remembers it no more, but yet we can't forget it. God says, hey, listen, I'm letting it go. And I'm calling you not guilty. You're free. Walk. Be free. But what do we do? We remember everything. It's easier to forget what we've done, but remember what everybody else did. Oh, I'm forgiven. The Lord saved me. Jesus did it. It's over. I'm, I'm sanctified, set free, but you a sinner. Yeah, we all know what I'm talking about. Sister so-and-so, oh, I heard about her. She's going to hell. Why is it that God remembers it no more, but yet we as people, that's what we wrap our lives around. We cannot forget it. The people, sometimes we say we, we um, love to life, we, we judge to death. Oh, I love you, but I'm judging you. It's good. I think it works most with like, you know, um, well, it doesn't work, but it happens a lot, even in our own homes, especially within our church. I'm not saying our church, but yeah, it happens in our church also, where we can see someone else and we could r raise and lift ourselves up to be here. And someone else, we say they're down here. They're, they can't really be called. They can't really be anointed. They don't really have a future with the Lord. Nah, there's no way that God wants to use them. God is saying, hey, listen, I've called you. I've anointed you. Let's not see people or ourselves for our past issues, but let's see ourselves and see them for who God says they are. Not guilty. Just like how our court is different now than it was even then, so, are, so is our church. They used to be in the temple preaching in the synagogues. They used to be, you know, I don't, I don't think Jesus was up in there like, hey, who's excited about me? Feast your eyes on the screen. There wasn't no fog machines, no good lighting, and the big old LED in the back, you know, making sure church service starts at 9 and 11 o'clock. Can't go a little bit over because the Lord. Oh, man, I'm preaching to myself right now, ain't I? Will, you hypocrite, Will. Woo, we better watch them stones. The church is so different. We, we start to pick out the things that we like and we don't like. Oh, man, I, I, I love this church, but they, they don't have, like, you know, the, the, the big screen in the back. I like the big screen. You know, the, 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 it's dim in the house, but, you know, I, I want it to be a little bit darker. Like, I want to just barely be able to read my Bible. Or it's too dark. I can't even read my Bible. You don't even read it at home. Um. Or, you know, like, it could get to where it's like, oh, uh, you know, I, the usher greeted me the wrong way. I didn't really like that song in worship. Like, I wish they would sing different songs. And we start getting into all these different things. And if Jesus was probably, like, doing church back then, and he, like, fast-forwarded himself here and then went back, he would have probably been like, I'm never going back to that church. Because, like, I don't know. Our minds also, we get into these places where we begin to complain about the blessings that God has given us. And I realize that our modern day church and what we do is so different of how Jesus would meet in the temple or in the synagogue. It's a lot different right now. But let me just tell you something. That God wants to use this kind of setting so we could reach the world. But we get so, like, complacent. We get comfortable and we, we get, like, gluttony with the church. Like spiritual gluttonous. Is that even a word? Sounds like it. But we, we just like, 
we're just like me, 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 and how I can be, me, 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 and God's wanting us to go out and give out and be the difference. Huh. It's, it's a beautiful calling the Lord has. But just like the modern day church is different now, the church was different back then. So here Jesus was preaching in the temple. Now imagine just like right now Jesus is preaching. And the Bible says in the book of John chapter 8 verse 2 through 11. Now early in the morning, somebody say early in the morning. He came again into the temple. Now obviously this wasn't for the second service people. It's early in the morning, y'all. Y'all missed the train. And all the people came to him. And he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. What the heck were they doing there? That's the first question. The second question is, how are you going to be interrupting a church service, bringing in a half-naked person, talking about we need to kill them? Y'all ready for this? This woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. The judgment was there and the stone was there. Such person should be stoned. But they asked Jesus. See, this is what the law of Moses says is to kill this woman what do you say about it? And I believe they were getting these stones. And they were like, Jesus, you get the judgment and you get the not guilty. What do you say we should do to this woman? Now hold that. See if I still got the moves. Ah. What do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something in which to accuse him. This is how the Pharisee mindset works. This is how judgment works. That not only are they bringing in someone to be judged in their presence, but then they want to find somebody else to judge while they're judging someone else. One judgment is not enough. There's more judgment coming from me right now. You don't pray enough. You don't, you don't sing loud enough. You don't even lift your hands during worship. Like, we start to, like, judge someone's life based upon what we want to see on the outside. But I've met a lot of people who are great on the outside and they're rotten on the inside. It's, it's true. It's true. I've, I've been done wrong by a lot of them. It happens. What do you say? They were testing him so they could find something to accuse him of. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Isn't this interesting? He didn't want to even listen to what they had to say. I want to tell you this morning, you need to begin to tune out the naysayers. You, you, you need to be able to tune out the Pharisees. You, you need to learn how to tune out those that come in judgment and say, man, they want to just expose someone else's sin while they're all messing around. Check this out. You want to, you want, you, here's some real truth right here. Y'all ready for this? This is Pastor Will telling on himself again. I was 20, what am I, 33 now? Man, 20, 33, tall, dark, and handsome. I was 20. Come on now. I was 20 years old. Traveling, I was ministering, sharing my story of what God had done in my life. I had a dramatic meeting with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Like, my life got rocked. And I was traveling and sharing my story everywhere. But I remember I, I was raised in a church that they taught us how to, like, sense the evil spirits and stuff. This is why I try to stay far away from this kind of craziness. Because, like, your job 
is to know what someone else is doing wrong. Instead of it being your job, as Christ has called us, to introduce him, introduce them to his presence. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. A lot of times we get so focused even in worship on what we can do to maybe to, to deliver someone else. Say, man, now, how far can we go into the presence of God to where someone can get those chains broken off of them? I just want to be in the presence of the Lord and just worship him in spirit and truth. I don't need to lay my hand on somebody, talk to somebody, or talk somebody out of something. God will do it for them because that's how good he is. I've seen it happen. But anyways, I grew up in a church where it, it was very charismatic, but it was also like very judgmental. It's like, so I became the, like the sin patrol. I was like a sin hound. Oh, I can smell sin all over these people. I'll be like, oh, so and so, who, who are they dating? Oh, over there. Oh, they sleeping together. I can smell it. Oh, so and so. Oh, they. Oh, oh, I know they be at the casino gambling and doing all this. Yeah. Oh, they. Oh, they drinkers. Drink, 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 drink. They sipping, right? They smoking. They doing. Check this out. This is this was this is how I used to be. Then I would go to my home, pornography, doing my little deal, and then. 20-year-old devil hound. And people, oh, I remember even asking, like, are you, if you were to die today, where would you go, brother? And, like, that was always my deal. Like, have you ever sinned before? Okay, then you're a sinning. Have you ever stole before? Then you're a, a little thief flyer. Like, that's how I would always reel people in. I always would want to hold the Ten Commandments up in front of them and make sure they measured up. That was my, my, my outreach. I led a lot more people to nowhere than I did to anywhere. Because judgment doesn't lead to true repentance. The goodness of God does. Whew. Say that again. Judgment and condemnation doesn't lead to true repentance. It says the goodness of God leads men to repentance. So I was like the <laughs> sinners. I was smelling out all the sin while I had my own closet sin, right? And I was like the 20-year-old preacher, teacher, on fire guy, and I would go places and make the crowd go wild for the Lord. And I would go home, beat my chest, like, oh, yeah, I did that. Uh. Self-righteous, prideful, lustful, full of anger, no self-control. All right. Telling on myself too much now. But anyways, some of you are like, oh, yeah, I like hearing your truth. Tell me more. <laughs> yeah. I was doing this, and Jesus stooped down. He wrote on the ground. And the Bible says, like this, then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience, because this is what Jesus said. He says, he said, he who is without sin among you, let him throw the first stone. Now, Jesus puts himself in a position where he's like, oh, what do I want to do? So now Jesus has the stones. He takes those stones and he says, you're right, the law of Moses does say to stone such person. But you know what? If you have no sin, anybody who has no sin, you go ahead. You make the decision. Jesus puts the ball back in their court. No condemnation. Nothing. He's just asking a simple question. Check this out. Jesus. I'm trying to lose the weight, guys. I'm trying. He who is without sin among you, let him throw the stone at her first. And again, he just went back down, wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their, being convicted by him, Jesus entwined with the Holy Spirit. If you know what the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is not a convictor. The Holy Spirit is a com com comforter. Come on, y'all. 
We're in class right now. The Holy Spirit is your comforter. Your comforter. He comforts you. He speaks life to you. But you know what? We're like, oh, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit. No. I believe the Holy Spirit will lead us into right and to know what is wrong, to be able to discern, right? But to convict someone is a judgmental act. To be convicted of a crime. What the Holy Spirit does is comforts. He doesn't condemn. He comforts. So Jesus, in this scene, comes and brings comfort right here. Check this out. They were, they were jacked up by their own conscience. But, oh, by the way, Jesus didn't convict them either. He just asked them a question, and they were convicted by their own minds. This is cool. This is awesome. When uh, they went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone. I love when it's just me and Jesus. I don't know about you, but I love when it's just me and Jesus. I got four kids at home right now, and I love when it's just me and Jesus. Come on. When they leave the house, and it's just me and Jesus, that's the best, that's the best time. When every judgment is, is moved out of the way, and it's just you and Jesus. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Giving you a white stone with a new name written on it. You came into this place with no name, identified by your sin. The woman caught in adultery identified by your history, identified by your problems, identified by your issues, identified by your mistakes, identified by the sins you've committed. And Revelations chapter 2 comes back up. And he says, I give this person a white stone with a new name written on it. While everyone was casting judgment stones of death, Jesus puts that away and he pulls out the white stone of purity, of love, of grace. And he says, I'm giving you a white stone, which means you are not guilty. And I'm giving you a new name. They might have known you as the adulterous woman, as the person who made all the mistakes, as, as, as the drunkard or as the, the, the drug addict or the gang member or the horrible father or mother, the lost sheep or son or daughter, the one who would never have hope or a future. You've probably been named all these different things, but Jesus comes into the scene and he says, not guilty, no condemnation, who condemns you? No one, good, neither do I. And I'm going to write on this stone your new name. And I believe that new name could be so many things. Free, redeemed, delivered, chosen. Only you know, because only you know what he brought you out of. Only you know, because only you know what he saved you from. Only known to you. 
Because only you know when you were crying out in that prison cell. Known only to the one who receives it. Wow. I don't know where you've been. I don't know what you've been through. I don't know what you've gone through. I don't know what you've said or what's been said towards you. I don't know what mistakes you made. I don't know all the condemnation letters that came at you. But what Jesus says about you is he says you are not guilty. I'm giving you a new stone. I'm giving you a new name. I'm giving you a fresh beginning. While everybody might be calling you out on something. While everybody else might be shaming you. I say shame off of you. While everybody else says they hate you and you're you're just a, a horrible person. You, you have no future. You have no hope. He says, I am your future, and I am your hope. I am the one who is going to save you, redeem you, deliver you, and bring you into a place of hope and freedom. Whew. Jesus doesn't carry black stones. He can't. It's not in his nature. Even before the death, burial, and resurrection, he was doing these kind of things because he came in the action of love. And while he had a chance, he was the only one in that circle that could have done this. Because he was the only one without sin. And he could have said, yes, you're right, scripture does say to stone such woman. The old covenant does say that, but I came to fulfill the new covenant. You know what the, also the old covenant says? Should I bring it all up? Because then we're all going to hell. Right? Come on now. If you're, matter of fact, Jesus ups the ante in the New Testament, actually. He just want, and he's speaking to the Pharisees. Hey, if you even look at a woman with lust, then you've already committed the thing. <laughs> I'll be in hell right now. I'm having to pray over myself weekly. If you have anger in your heart towards a brother, that's murder. I need to repent weekly. You know how many people have done me wrong? They say they love me and then they hate me the next day. It is what it is. It happens. But you know what else happens? We get to refocus on the goodness of God. And how he redeemed us, delivered us, and set us free. And how when he could have thrown the black stone, he's given us the white stone. Jesus was the only one in that circle that could have came at her with this. Hey, anybody without sin, go ahead and throw the stone. I have every right, but I will not. Somebody needs to start handing these mugs out to some people. Some of y'all need to go back to some people you talk to. You know how many people I've been trying to search on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and MySpace that I judge to death? That probably never wanted to step foot back into the church because I thought I was like the savior hound. Sniffing out everyone's sin when I couldn't even keep my anger in line. C couldn't keep my eyes focused. Couldn't keep my mind right. I renewed it yesterday, Lord, I promise. Anyways. All right. I'm going to end it like this. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. Started up my clothing line, which kind of got paused for a little bit. CXS, Christ canceled sin. He canceled the record of the charges against us. What? What? He canceled the record of the charges against us. What? He canceled the record of the charges against us. He canceled the record of the charges against us. He canceled the record of the charges against you and I. And took it away by nailing it to the cross. If that don't get you excited and pumped up about something, I don't know what will. But I'm proud to know that my God has been good to me. 
He had every right to condemn me, to shun me, to walk away, to let me go. But he loved me right where I was at. He called me in. He canceled the record of the charges against us. Ooh. Sometimes there's scriptures that pop up. We didn't even know that were in the Bible that make us just want to slap somebody. Wow. When I found this scripture, we created a whole clothing line and then it just fell. So we got to bring it back to life in Jesus' name. Come on. He canceled the record of the charges against us. Listen, you are free. You're redeemed. God's got you. When you think you don't deserve it, God says, I see you worth it. When you feel like you want to throw in the towel, God says, you know what? No, I'm going to catch that thing, and I'm bringing you into freedom. Come on. God is faithful. He is good. He is awesome. He is holy. He is wonderful. And he's saying, hey, I have a plan for you, even when you don't have a plan for yourself. Today, I'm going to pray for you and me. <laughs> That we would stop seeing ourselves the way the devil wants us to, to see ourselves. The devil's a liar. He's a liar. He's going to say, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. You did that, you did that, you did that. But you know what Jesus does? Just like when I was in the courtroom jumping over pews and over everything else and clinging on, Jesus jumped on over and he clinged on to us and he says, I'm not letting go. I got a future for you. There is something that I got destined for your life. Come on. Woo. In every religion, it's always chase God, chase God, chase God. In Christianity, it's God chasing you. Every other religion, every other thing out there is like, oh man, work your way to get to the goodness of God. And God's goodness is coming after you. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for your grace we thank you for your favor. We thank you, Lord, for giving us a white stone with a new name on it. Woo! We thank you for delivering us, freeing us, giving us a hope and a future. Thank you for your strength, your wisdom. Thank you, Lord, for, for directing our lives. And we love you. We praise you. We ask that you would continue to have your way in and through our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody said amen, amen. and amen. Hey, listen, if you're needing prayer today, I want to invite the prayer team to come on up. We would love to pray with, pray for you and just encourage you. Don't forget your children in the classroom. I know I went a little few minutes over. Bless your hearts. We'll see y'all next Sunday. Let's go.